Okay, uh, good evening everybody, thank you. And thanks uh, for, for organizing tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'll try, I'll try to go, as I say, uh, as quick as possible. There are a lot of slides. Uh, I thought to have an hour, a bit more than one hour, but I will try to fit it in one hour. And it's good for once to have a relaxed time to do it, you know, because generally they always tell you, you have 15 minutes. And <laughs> So I just put together a couple of railway concepts just to give an idea. I'm not sure how much um, you are into railways. And uh, so just a few slides to say what, are, what, what is the important, why are we designing railways and then why are we designing light rails. Uh, I found four main reasons really. And uh, one is that it takes much less running resistance because it's, uh, wheels, the wheels are steel and rails are steel. So the friction coefficient is very low. And there is no deformation like you would have on rubber wheels on asphalt. Therefore, the force that we need to pull uh, a certain amount of weight on a train is about one one fifth of the force you would need on a road vehicle. About. So it's very efficient from an energy point of view. Second point is that there are no driving issues because the rails are driving the vehicle. So you can have as many cars as you like. The length being dictated probably by the sidings and the length of the stations. So one man can in theory pull. Uh, thousands of, of tons of freight and passengers. The other three reasons are that the corridor is generally narrow and there is less use, so it's more optimized use of public land. And then it's safe. It's far the safest the transport system after, after uh, the airplane. Um, how do these apply to the uh, light rail system? There is less energy spent, less urban air pollution also because the, the light rail goes with electricity and is produced somewhere else outside the city and then you can produce it as green as you like. There are no driving issues, so again optimization, optimi optimization of resources, drivers, energy, eye transportation capacity. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to the capacity, but I mean, one of our drivers can transport up to, in the future, trams up to 340, 360 passengers. When I say the future, it's the longer trams that we are procuring at the moment for the Green Line. Uh, and the corridor is narrow. So I just made a small comparison with the same corridor width uh, of two bus lanes. A light rail can transport 7,000 passengers per hour per direction while a bus lane can transport 2,000. About the, the, the ratio now 5 to 1 is a bit optimistic, but I'd say it's three, 3 to 1 probably. And then the reliability goes without saying. So those are two typical graphs that you would find everywhere in the literature. It's the capacity and the speed, the commercial. So capacity there, speed there. The buses are within that range. BRT is really when you push it towards the corner of this block. And then if you want to go higher capacity in the range of 2,000, 3,000, you need to get into the light rail semi system, higher commercial speed, we're reaching the 30 kph of commercial speed, commercial is stop to go, really stop to stop, including everything. And then when you get there, you're probably aiming at uh, 40,000 passengers per hour per direction, you are into the metro, metro systems there. But that's the scale of, of the action. So when I hear, uh, I mean, I'm not criticizing tonight, but I feel a bit free to tell my opinions about everything. So I'm not TII tonight, okay? Uh, when, you, when you hear that BRT can do the same job of a light rail, I mean, that, it's as simple as this. It can't be. It's not reality. Now we can sell it as we want. It's not the reality. Um, track functions and uh, key components. <coughs> now we go into the track elements. What the track is supposed to do is supporting the vehicle, guiding, moving. So when I say those three are the three forces that you see there, supporting so vertical weight, guiding is a, it's an horizontal transversal force, and then uh, moving the vehicle is a longitudinal force transmitted to the rail. And then we want to provide a very smooth surface. So that, that doesn't happen with the roads, while with the rail, which with the, the, the surface is as smooth as possible, and it has to be maintained like that. Reducing, because that we need to reduce vertical and tangential forces to reduce the energy and to reduce the consumption, uh, the consume, uh, the, sorry, the wear of, of the materials. And that second point is achieved with a good alignment, so as flat as possible and little curves. It has to drain and it has to distribute the stress on the ground. And then ease of construction, ease of maintenance, reducing life cycle cost, the durability. Those are factors that you, you, you would apply to all, the to, to all the engineering in general, but much more to railways because our 
maintenance windows when the system is in operation on the Lewis, for example, we have only four hours each night. And there are metro systems where you barely have one hour, two hours, London underground, some lines, they don't have any time for maintenance. That's why you want to build it and needs to be brace and belts, safe, as safe as possible from a maintainability point of view. And that's why also railway systems are generally overdimensioned. It goes without saying. I mean, we could probably transport our Lewis on much smaller rails much less concrete, but then it wouldn't last as it has to last. Uh, <clears throat> those are the three forces I was telling you about. It's interesting just to see one thing, that the wheel has a flange, that's the way the wheel works, and it's slightly conical shape, and it sits on the rail, as you can see there. This is a groove rail we're using for a better track, we'll see it later. But the flange, the function of the flange is that because the railways have the positive of very little friction, steel on steel, that's also the negative. It can't be guided by the friction as, as a rubber tire vehicle. So we need the flange to guide the, the train. So when there is a curve, the two flanges, the two, the wheel set moves towards the external. There is a bit of play there. And this flange gets in contact with the guiding rail. And that's what guides the vehicle through the curve. And what happens is that longitudinally speaking, for, for traction, we don't have friction either. So we need more axles with, with motors because we need more contact points with infrastructure. Uh, and that's the other negative. The last negative I'd say of the railways is that it takes much longer to break. That, that's not so much true for light rail because the light rail system is a road vehicle before being a railway system. But for trains or for metro systems, the braking distance is much longer because the friction is very little. So to take into consideration that the braking distance is longer, we need signal control systems because the, it can't be line of sight. The line of sight means that the driver, is, when we're driving the car, this is line of sight. You react with the speed according to the distance you see free in front of you. That can't happen for normal trains because when there is an obstacle, it's too late to brake. That's why they need signal, signaling, assisting the driver. That does not apply to the LUAS. As I said, the LUAS is a road rail vehicle. It has to brake as efficient as cars or road vehicles because it's part of the streetscape. And how do we do that? We have emergency brakings that can come into play, which are magnetic plates that stick on the rails and increase the friction coefficient to get three meters per square second. But this is just an over, uh, overall view. Uh, I'm not sure how much is important for track and rail, but the important thing is to see how the rail is coupled with the, with the, with the wheel. Um, and those are the key components uh, of uh, a typical ballast track, but we'll see them later on. Uh, the two most important are the rails. We have a groove rail, we use a, a particular type of groove rail with a particular groove width that is suitable for our wheels. And that's the most important thing is the curve radius there, which matches well with the curve radius of the root of the, of the wheel. And the same is for this rail. So the, uh, this corner there is the same as this one. With the only difference is that this rail gets installed inclined 1 to 40, while this gets, gets installed vertical. Uh, it's an historical reason. This, uh, this is an historical rail and it was installed inclined towards the center to react to lateral forces in a better way. Well, this was invented a bit after, so there was no need of doing that. But the important thing is that when you tilt this rail and you superimpose it, those two parts match perfectly one to the other. And that's what a transition rail does. This is what we use to transit from this rail to that rail. You can see the groove starts there, and this is the big null rail, as we call it. So we have a lot of these pieces on Lewis Cross City uh, when we pass from an embedded track to, uh, to the slab track. Um, they work like beams, really. That's the, that's the reason for the shape of the rail. It's a beam because it usually, it, it used to be simply supported on the, on the, on the sleepers. And at the same time, the top part is designed to interfere with the, with the wheel. That's how uh, a wheel set sits on the two types of rail. You can see that the top drawing, the two rails are slightly inclined towards the center, as I said to you. And there is a bit of play there, uh, just for the better insertion in, in curves. That's what, happen what happens in a curve. High transversal forces, pushing the wheel set on one side, we get one of the wheel gets in contact and the other gap opens. That's what happens always. So the tram is moving towards the balance of, of the center line. 
uh, this is a more detailed approach of the contact. In theory, we, we are trying to design to have a single contact point because if there is one single contact point, there is always rolling and there is no friction, there is no wear of material. But that can't happen. It's pure theory. And unfortunately, we always have a vertical force transfer to the center of the ray and the guiding force is transferred through that. So what happens at the end of the day is that either these or these are sliding Therefore, there is friction and therefore there is wear, which we generally see on this side, because this is very heavy. So that wouldn't slide, this is sliding much more. We see side wear on the rails that then brings the rails to end of life uh, on, the tight, on the tight curves. This is the same on the, on the open rail, on the big knot rail. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, some, some of the details there. One, one was asking me one, one day, why is the group so big? compared to the flange of the wheel, and that's, that's an issue for cyclists, as we all know, for Lewis Cross City. Uh, and this is 42 millimeter wide. The reason why it's so wide is because, as I said to you, this is a, a balanced position. But when, when in the curve the other wheel moves away, that flange moves closer to what we call the keeper of the rail, so that gap opens, and we don't want the back of the flange getting in contact with the keeper, because that keeper is not structurally sound to support any load. The only reason for the keeper is to keep the asphalt away from the flange way. That's the reason for that. So that's why it needs to be wide. Also because you imagine there is tolerance in the wheel construction, tolerance in the wheel maintenance. There is wear of the other rail as well. So when you factor in the maximum wear of the rail, the maximum wear of the wheel, this gap almost shuts down. You know? So that 42 is really the minimum we want for, uh, for a good maintenance. This is why the wheels are so wide? Our wheels about, are about uh, 10 centimeters wide. Uh, and why are they so wide? They could be smaller. The reason is the way they negotiate switches and crossings. And this is, I, I know it, it could be a bit detailed, this is when the wheels are passing through the turnout. Turnout is the, is the switch in the rail. And this is the crossing area. So that's the crossing nose. Uh, this is the critical part. How this wheel couples with this system? So it has to transfer the load from the nose, which is touching this part. Imagine that this sits down. Then the nose becomes smaller and smaller, and the wing rail becomes bigger and bigger, and the load is transferred from the nose to the wing rail. That's why you want the wheel to be so wide, so that it can transfer the load between the two parts. There are networks where they don't do it. They use very narrow wheels, and then they need to run on the tip of the flange. Uh, but I'd say it's an old approach. Modern approaches are like this. The wheel so wide I is an issue for us. So to have this benefit, we are paying the price somewhere else. And I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, that's exactly what I was telling you about the transfer of load in the, in the crossing node. I'll, I'll probably fly through that. We'll, we'll go back to this issue of the width of the uh, track types now. Uh, segregated and embedded, those are the two big families of track types that we have. The segregated track is ballast, a slab, green, plint, direct fixation. Embedded is the one on the road, wh which uses the groove rail. So those two rails are associated with those types of, of track. Ballast track is the traditional railway track, so I won't spend time on that. This is uh, a picture taken on Lewis Cross City. That's the double track, ballast track in Cabra area. It's the most flexible track type, the less expensive. I'd say always I take in mind 1,000 1, euros per linear meter construction cost. And the uh, <coughs> sleepers are, in our system, we space them 75 centimeters, uh, but that depends on the system. And 300 millimeter of ballast below the sleeper. And then the rest is sub ballast and then capping layer. The two drainages on each side, cable ducts under the embankments, you can see there. Um, this is another very good arrangement in Red Cow, uh, the entrance to, to the depot. So ballast track is flexible, is, is, is very, is very um, I'd say it would be my first choice if I could. I mean, I tried to put it in O'Connell Street, I <laughs> told me I couldn't do it. But jokes aside, I mean, if you go to Germany and you step out the, the station in, in Frankfurt, uh, just in the center of Frankfurt, they have ballast track, just crossing there. I mean, the Germans are only looking at the practicality of the things, probably, more so than the visual aspect. While we took more from the French approach on the Luas. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't use ballast track in the street. That's where we used it. This is like B1 in, uh, in uh, Baliogan Road. And initially there was huge opposition because people thought, how can you put ballast track along a footpath and it's working. 
it's actually less prone to vandalism. People were afraid of kids throwing stones, using stones across the boundary wall. Never happened. And now maybe the area is not so prone to that kind of behavior, but uh, it works very well. And people are walking along the line. The speed is 50 kph here. There is no risk. If anything, it doesn't attract people. Well, embedded track would give the impression you can step on it. Uh, the other positive aspects, uh, it, it's suitable for very high speeds. Maintenance is very, very cheap. Um, the one thing on, about maintenance, there is a, the, people tend to think that ballast track has to be readjusted because it's a flexible, uh, it can move with time. So the alignment is not fixed because of the lateral pressure, the rails can move with the slippers within the ballast. But that doesn't happen for us as much as for the heavy rail because we use a very similar standard to the heavy rail but our load, axle load, is only 10 ton per axle. So we don't transfer so much load into the track. So there is not so much maintenance, not even from the point of view of aligning and uh, re wh wh what we call tamping, which is a machine that comes and put the track in the new alignment. Um, visual aspect, I don't think is best. Noise-wise, is probably the second best track. It absorbs the noise. Um, so a lot of positive there. Um, slab track is a similar system with the only difference that the ballast is replaced with concrete. So it's made of sleepers uh, which are embedded into a concrete bed. Those sleepers can be simple B blocks as in this case, so the two blocks are not linked together. Or it can be two blocks linked together or a com complete concrete sleeper. There are different systems, as many as we want. The fundamental aspect, this is Lua's uh, 2004, so it doesn't come, uh, the title is off the screen yet. But that's uh, the, the original green and red lines. They were built with this Edilon, uh, <coughs> called Edilon block system. The reason for that is that there was a double layer of elasticity. There is core clust with a, a concrete tray with a, a rubber material there, and then there is rail pad under the So the double resilience is supposed to act in reducing noise and vibration, ground borne vibration. Actually, the problem that we had with this track, we are still facing it, is that those blocks are getting loose and there is no gauge control. When I say gauge, is the distance between the two rails, which to a track man is the fundamental parameter. Okay, everything else can go, not, not can go, but I mean, but not the gauge, you will have a derailment immediately. And if the blocks are not linked together, that sound, that rings already an emergency bell to me. Uh, <coughs> so that's, that's what's happening uh, at the moment there. Um, this is built, generally is built uh, as a, as a top-down. When I say top-down, means that the track, the sleepers and the rails are installed and then they're lined and leveled through different means, through spindles or through horses, jigs, and then the concrete is poured so that it embeds the, the rail, the, the pads from under. That's the way, what we call top-down. Bottom-up would be that you build a concrete slab and then you need probably to drill in the slab a direct fix session for the rails. Generally the difference is that the top down as it is this one is much more accurate because once you line and level the rails with the topographic instruments you know where the rails are and now you can pour concrete and you just cast it as is. Well with the top down, with the bottom up you are pouring a slab that you don't know which exactly the level will be and then you need to adjust somewhere the rails, the levels with some grout or additional materials. It's a bit more difficult to build. This is the slab track we, have been we, 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 are, we are using now for Lewis Cross City. Very similar, but according to our specification, the contractor came back with a, a sleeper system. Now you, you can see there is a, a crossbar, actually two, two crossbars between the two blocks. Um, <coughs> and that's the finished aspect here down there of the, of the slab track. Plint track is another form of slab track, with the only difference that the, the rails are installed on plinths. Uh, why do we use that? We mainly use plane track on bridges. The reason being that the bridge deck is poured initially probably by different contractors with a different uh, tolerance. And we know that civil contractors wouldn't have enough experience for their rail tolerance, which is plus or minus 3 mil, while a civil contractor is probably plus or minus 20 mil. Then what happens is that we need the planes to regulate the levels, to adjust the correct level of the rail on the incorrect level of the, of the bridge, pass me my, my word, not incorrect, but higher tolerance. And then the planes also provide a derailment container. Now in this case, there is also an additional rail, 
but because we are on top of a bridge for safety reasons we want to be able to contain a potential derailment of the tram so if the tram goes out it still fits falls in between the planes and it's retained this is the direct fixing that we've been using on the on the on the planes now there would be i could spend one hour telling you pros and cons of this a uh, lot of cons I'd say uh, this is a Voslo system. We are in discussion with the contractor. What's happening? Just to give you an idea of the problems, you see this curve there. This rail, this rail exactly on the, on this bridge, is now lifting, and this lifting. My interpretation: we're still looking at it. It's the in the in the cold weather that rail hasn't been properly <coughs> neutralized. The temperature when the rail was installed installed and it's with the cold weather the rail is contracting and therefore it's pulling towards the inside of the curve and is lifting uh, is tilting the, the fastenings and so the two external bolts of that fastener there the two external are being pulled out of the of the planes uh, and if you look at the shape of the bolts they are not anchoring enough you know they're not as wide as they should be under the concrete i would have done that with a with a very bull head at the end so that's probably not resisting as much as we want to do the pulling force. This is grass track. We have it on the Luas uh, in some places. This is the red line in Fatima. Um, it's a nice track. <coughs> Sorry, just before going there, I'd say that on the slab track, um, I, I give you my opinions. I mean, I wouldn't be using slab, tra slab track everywhere. It's not as visual attractive as, as the ballast, I think. Um, it's claimed to be maintenance free. It, so far based on our experience is not because as, so, as soon as something goes wrong with slab track you are into repairing concrete and repairing concrete grouts chemical anchoring it's always difficult especially with the forces we're speaking about realigning is impossible if there is a slight deflection of the subgrade then you lose the alignment and you can't stamp it as you would do with the ballast you can lift the ballast track well this is a very tricky track and from a point of view of noise and vibration, it's quite noisy because it reflects all the noise coming from the vehicle. And you can probably hear, if you live in the Ranala Beachwood area along the Green Line, you can hear the noise expanding around the city, possibly up to Sandy Mount. So going back to the green track, this is the way it was built on the Luas before. Um, it's an embedded track, as you can see, using groove rail, concrete shoulders on both sides, and then three grass pockets. I wouldn't call it grass track. This is an embedded track with a grass finish. A lot of drainage, a lot of workmanship, very expensive system. There are different ways. We looked at, we carried out a test on, on line A1, retrofitting an existing slab tra track into a simpler grass track version, which we found in Switzerland and Germany. By using the, instead of using the groove rail, as you see in the original, we use the Vignol rail, which is cheaper and easier to maintain. The second point is that this rail is accessible because there are only rubber fillers around the rail and just torf, so you can remove them and replace the rail if you need. While with the other rail you need to cut out the, uh, the concrete and access the rail. And uh, that's the way it looks like. This was our cross section of the test. These are straight systems, so there are, it's a recycled rubber, rubber with uh, blocks covering the poles and the fasteners and then a, a rubber material for drainage. Vandalism wise, we try and test it as well. Stray current is, is quite good. Stray current is the resistance to leakage of the currents from the rail. And we, we did all those sorts of tests. So that will probably be our grass track in the future. I'm going to the um, embedded track, which is far the most interesting for our presentation, also because it's the light rail track by definition. It's the one you see through the city based on, on the use of groove rail, when we have to pave flush with the rails. So there are different finishes, as you can see, the granite sets, there is imprinted concrete there, this is Talla, uh, double cr uh, CISO crossover at the terminus. There could be uh, tactile paving for deterrent paving, um, imprinted concrete for pedestrians, asphalt again, uh, through the yellow box. So it's, it's very flexible. The pros are visual, urban realm architectural and to allow other vehicles to use the infrastructure. So when you're share running through the junctions, there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. The negatives of embedded track are a lot, as we, as we all know after having been through the Lewis Cross City construction. It's a very expensive construction, very difficult to design, very difficult to get it right, 
and it's really extremely difficult. I'm not saying in Dublin, it's everywhere in Europe. Actually, we're we getting it probably better than other cities, I'd say. Tighter construction tolerances, and then it's a road and track design. So how do you design the, the slab, the reinforcement? Is that according to the a track manual, which wouldn't tell you anything about embedded track because track manuals are mostly for ballast track? or it's a road design, then you need to use the DMRB or the design manual for road and bridges. And then there is the problem of the groove, the rail keeper back flange contact, which I was telling you about before, so tighter tolerances, and then maintenance, replacing the rails is a nightmare. The vertical design, that's an alignment issue, is more difficult because you need to tie in exactly with the threshold, with the footpaths, with the shopkeepers, with the thresholds of the buildings, and once you cast the track, all the rest of the cross section of the road is fixed. That happened in Dawson Street, where we had to realign vertically in our reference design two, three times, and then probably the contractor had to do it another time to just get it right in terms of levels with a cross fall of the, you know, everything is linked to that. So it's a very, very convoluted design. Cost is about three times the one of ballast track and about 50, 70% more than the slab. Especially if you go for a very expensive finish like Lewis Cross City in the city center with granite sets. You can imagine the workmanship associated with that. Uh, this is the embedded track on the Lewis in 2004, the original lines. Very simple approach. The rails are independent one from each other and they are coated, factory coated in a ALH is the name. It's a rubber coating around the rails just to give a bit of resilience, elasticity to the rail in the and to prevent stray current. This is the two reasons for the rubber coating around the rails. We can't embed rails directly in concrete. There would be too many issues with that. M the first one is the stray current. We have a requirement of 10 ohm kilometer of resistance for the utilities, because otherwise we, we, we would contribute to the corrosion of, of the pipes underground. And then there is a single, a first layer of concrete, and you can see the details down there, plus a second layer, which could be either concrete in case it's imprinted finish, or it could be asphalt or granite sets. In the two last cases, they use those two concrete upstands along the rails, which we call concrete shoulders, with a very really light reinforcement. And we'll get to there on Lewis Cross City, we'll see what has been done there. This is the Lewis 2009, similar system, but there is an additional kind of fastener that was poured within the first slab and then adjusted, fine-tuned before the second pour. So that, that, that's probably more an assistance during construction than anything else. Uh, it's only in 2010 with the Luas B1 that we see the appearance of a sleeper system. This is a flat steel sleeper that then we would have used then on Luas Cross City again. Uh, it's very handy, very light system, but at least what the sleeper does, it ensures the gauge is controlled, the cant, the coplanarity of the rail is controlled, and it helps during construction stage. Because uh, otherwise you would have to deal with two separate rails, uh, jigs supporting the rails from the top, while the sleepers would help supporting from under. And they get lost in the concrete once you pour it, but they are, are an additional mean of keeping the rails together, even during the, the life of the infrastructure. This is 2011, is line A1, the extension to um, City West. And in this case, the sleepers were much more sound. Those are Rida uh, sleepers with a truss in between B blocks, and then they get embedded into the full concrete. Now, in this case, one could argue why to spend so much effort in sleepers if you are then using concrete. You see the finish is full concrete up to the top of the rail. So in that case, it's probably a lot of cost for the sleepers. Uh, so again, there is no standard. I'm not telling you something is right or wrong. It's, it often depends on our contractors as well. We always procure the system as a design and build, giving some uh, employer requirements, functional employer requirements. It's only in Lewis Cross City we were a bit more strict in terms of employer requirements, but generally we wouldn't have been. So every line came with a different embedded track approach, apart from the rails that are the, the interface with the vehicle, they need to be the same. So, few sections of road and rail in the previous lines in Dublin, so they were mostly segregated. It's only when we got to the Lewis Cross City that we started thinking, this line is going to be segregated only for the 50%, the other 50 will be shared. And it's shared in the city centre with the heaviest bus traffic that the city, the city has. Um, so, these are the old Lewis. 
But even on the old Lua's, these are the challenges we are facing today. Road rail interface issues, the shoulders are breaking at several of the few junctions that we have, they are breaking. And when they get broken, 60%, uh, this is a survey we carried out three years ago, 60% have some kind of defects. This is probably the worst case. They get loose. And what you do then, we start repairing them with fast curing, setting, whatever kind of grouse that we have. They will generally get loose again after a couple of years. Just because of the traffic interface, imagine vehicles crossing every day. And this is a small upstand of concrete along the rail. Uh, those are some of the defects. Other defects you can see, you remember when I told you about the wheel that is wide, we had concrete running along the rail generally that will come in contact with the tread of the wheel, especially when the, when the rail wears down in the lifetime. And that what happens is if we are lucky, we get what we call a V-shape deterioration, which is this one. It just breaks down slowly, but then it's a gap, and when you get water ingress, you are in trouble. We all know that the water is the worst enemy of road systems, and that's, that's what happens after. Can I just ask a question? You yeah. talk about wear between the rail and the wheel. Are, are they the same um, metallurgic properties or is the rail no. tougher than the wheel? You know, I'm just asking. Yeah, that, that, no, that's a very good question. We, in our system, actually, our wheels are harder than the rails, okay. which it shouldn't be. Yeah, I'm <laughs> frank enough. I mean, I've never seen that before coming to Dublin. It should be the other way around because the wheels are easier to maintain yeah. in the depot. You can, you can reprofile them. Why in Dublin? They were chosen like this way that the rails are softer it's only with lewis cross city that we introduced harder rails in this fight between the infrastructure and the vehicle maintenance we got it uh, on the tight bands mm -hmm. but generally it should be the rail harder than the wheel yeah I, I agree with you the worst thing you can have is the two similar materials mm -hmm. because then you don't control the where where it goes you know yeah. i i have my own interpretation of why that decision was taken in dublin mm -hmm. um, but I won't share it with you, it's, it's, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Maintenance issues, uh, this is uh, a typical example of replacing one rail in the mortuary. This is the mortuary curve on the line uh, A uh, behind uh, James's hospital. It took us four nights to take out 18 meter of single rail. Four nights, the workforce was made about 35 people. I don't want to know the cost of that. So imagine that's only because the rail is casting concrete in the shoulders and the shoulders are very small so when you slice them off the last part that you leave in place is structurally unsound so what do you do then we did another exercise now top of stevens lane just recently a month ago and the outcome i wasn't happy with the outcome at all so the gauge is all over the place and so it's i'm not saying it's the fault of the maintainer it's just very difficult to deal with them that's what we try to deal with on uh, on west cross city Let's see what happened with Lewis Cross City. The, we knew that construction sites would have been very tight. We are working, the contractor is working on very tight, sometimes 3.5 meters wide uh, construction sites between traffic lanes. The alignment is one of the most complex alignments of the Lewis system, very curvy. We had to match the curvature of the Trinity College, just to give an, an, an idea there. Uh, railroad joints would have been fundamental. The joint that we see on top of the rail that I show you that is damaged on the original Lewis lines, we can't have that damage, especially when you can't repair it, because imagine when there is traffic running over there, you should shut down completely College Green to repair it. So it, it needs to be almost maintenance free, Lewis Cross City. And then the other point is, is a road and railway, is a railway, is a road, what it is. I mean, the discussion over the design of the embedded track took us probably the good of six months to decide which way to design it with, uh, with the contractor. Uh, that's why before starting West Cross City already in 2009, we started uh, an international, long international benchmark and research and real scale tests into innovative way of building the embedded track. The final results were presented at several congress. So I'd say Dublin is at, at the moment, we are ex not exporting, I, I, I don't want to sing my song, but we are becoming a reference in Europe as a, as a good light trade system. I, we are all proud of that. I think the Lewis is seen as, as a very efficient system. And then we went around, this is Paris, for example, how do they build it? And I'm trying, there are a lot of networks here, so I'll try to skip through them. I want to go to the focus, but just to give an idea that every system is different, every nation is different, 
and in the same country different cities would have different standards so not only there is no national standards there, there is not even international standards there is nothing so this is Paris they are using proprietary French imagine what slippers <laughs> with uh, filler blocks around the rails sativa slippers and for example they use this kind of bar to be sure that the slipper gets embedded gets embedded very well in the concrete and then they use filler blocks we see the filler blocks coming out again those big blocks of rubber like the ones I, we used here for the green, the green track the problem with those guys is that they are very flexible, very soft. They are generally recycled rubber and they are short. They are pieces of this length. So what happens, you have a lot of joints on them, which generally they suggest you to glue them together. So the size quality becomes essential. And the second point is that stray current is not ensured at all. Because as soon as the glue gives way, you get water ingress through the joints and you lose the, the sealing property of the, of the encapsulation. And actually what they do, this is very interesting because they were claiming there is no problem at road junctions. What they do at road junctions, they need to use an additional steel plate. Sure, they catch those after, after concrete is cast, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> or they let the trams <laughs> cut in there. But this is just to prove that this is too flexible. They want the steel surface for the asphalt. Otherwise the asphalt joint would fail. And we'll see that again in other networks. This is Berlin, the new... The, the German approach is very easy going, very easy going, but yes, again, very efficient and probably very low cost. Sleepers, those are the Rida sleepers we have used on Line 1 as well, but they use a, a bottom rubber profile because the bottom profile you can imagine is the one that dictates the elasticity. So that's fundamental. The mechanical properties of that profile are fundamental. While on the side of the rail, they don't care. The sleepers are keeping control of the gauge and the alignment. So it's like if the side of the rail doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need any support and they put a flexible foam filler again. But their lines are mostly segregated. There is no road traffic apart from the junction. So they have no concern of the joint and the stability of the road. Because the, the problem for me, it's not the stability of the track. That's given by sleepers and cop. It's the stability of the road pavement and the asphalt. Especially in a context like this in Dublin, you know, where this is would come after us as soon as there is two centimeters of gap, you know, maybe they have roads completely cracked elsewhere, but this is the track now. Uh, lines are mostly segregated from traffic, that's what I was saying, and this is probably all, all what we mentioned. Freiburg, again, a very easy system. They use a system which is called Phoenix, is a thin encapsulation all along the rail made of three, three profiles with two joints there and there. So the bottom profile is designed for the elasticity. Side profiles are uncompressible. You see there is no voids there. The profiles under the railhead are very, very empty so that they don't provide any structural resistance to the loads. And that's all designed around the rail. And it provides a jacket which is 18 meters long. So there is a joint every 18 meters. That's why we love this system. It's the system that we have in Dublin as well since the three line ex Lewis extensions with different modifications of the top profile, but we have, we have used this on Lewis Cross City as well. It gets installed and the, those profiles are glued on the rails in size, on size, under a control environment. So we, we need a tent, humidity control and things like that. But actually it proved to be quite efficient for Lewis Cross City. And this is the way Freiburg works so with tie bars to control the gauge. They are, tie bars are web bolted and then they are their proprietary, their own fastenings that gets embedded into the concrete bed. So again, a top-down technology. Uh, at Zurich is far the best system, I think. This, this is where I wanted to go, if I could be free to decide, um, which I'm not because of the number of stakeholders we're dealing with. Uh, so the two rails with a crossbar, as in, uh, as in, uh, in Freiburg, crossbar is there, there are proprietary fastenings, look at the dimension of those guys, they get, em they get embedded into the first, the clear green, which is the first concrete pour, and then they put an additional grout, in, you see it in, in grey there, to be sure that the rail is continuously supported, so they don't want to rely on the concrete pour to support the rail, because there could be voids, there could be air bubbles, so what they do then, they shutter again, you see the two small shutters there, and they pour this grout under the rail, which is self-flowing and, and non-shrinking grout. And finally, a second layer of concrete up to 40 mil from the top of the rail. 
so it's when you see their construction I probably I'm not sure that I see it there you probably see it there the second layer is almost coming to the top and they only leave the last 40 mil to the asphalt why do they do that because asphalt is a tricky material it can compress it can break it the, the less you use the less compressible it is and it's subject to temperature you know Zurich probably they have very hot summers very cold winters a bit different than what we have here but yes they want to control that and then they have two joints you see the black joints on two sides of the rails there these are pullable mastic joints and they do that because of the wheel the, the width of the wheel so we have looked at that we say we want this The gauge is only meter, not everywhere. This is from, no, it does not. They, they have 1435 as well. Sorry, you're, you're right, it's curious, I never noticed that. But we have the two drawings as well. It's, this is probably for the old trans system, sister replaced, but they have the same for the new. Um, and that, that's the detail that works. You can see that in the ground there. Mm. The other idea is that they can lift the rail out in the future and reinstall it on the existing fasteners. Once they expose them, they can reuse them. And that's where we took our idea from as well. And this is the way it works. No concrete shoulders around the rails and the asphalt is working perfectly. And this is a bus lane, so there are buses running there as well. Uh, Edinburgh, I'm not going to spend the time there. This was, uh, it's known in the history of tramway systems as a disaster. And it was a, a problem, especially in the city centre, Princess Street, because of the joint. Look at what happened there. This wasn't still, o this wasn't even open to, to railway traffic. This was only the bus traffic destroying the joints, because they used uh, very flexible C-shaped rubber fillers that wouldn't resist to lateral loads. Uh, Croydon, uh, quite similar to the French approach. This is Bergen in Norway, where they used another system, CDM booting. So the rates are cast into, they are surrounded by those filler blocks from the bottom to the two sides. So you're putting, you're putting your faith in these filler blocks by doing that and there is no gauge control. The gauge is controlled by the filler blocks which are quite flexible. Some kind of shoulder, concrete shoulders up to the middle of those filler blocks. And what we notice, what we, uh, you see that they use the steel plate. In this case they go from under rather than from the top. Like for the road junctions. I went there after two years. All the road junctions are failing, all the joints are coming in bits. And the funny thing on the tight bends, we notice there is a back flange contact on the internal rail without any wear on the external rail. To a railway man, that means that there is a gauge spreading when the tram is passing. Because if there is back flange contact, either there is a lot of wear on the, uh, on the guiding rail or the gauge is widening. And that it can only be because of the lateral force of the tram is not counteracted by this rubber. So the rubbers are flexible, too, too much flexible. And that's a problem with the filler blocks that I can see. They need, uh, actually using filler blocks without even the sleepers. It's, you know, my reading is, is a recipe for a disaster. Uh, this is Nottingham type one, the old system, like in Dublin, the original Dublin with the shoulders Nottingham track two, type 2 is the, the second line just built uh, recently with the uh, this is a slip formed system automatic it's an Alstom so what it does there is this machine that slip forms the base and it sticks in the fixings directly at the correct level and we, we investigated into the use of this it promised to be a very quick system to pass through the city centre but actually what we noticed then on the West Coast City is that the most of the time is taken by utilities relocation and then road paving uh, whatever it takes all before the track and then all what's after the track is there so if you're only dealing with the track I don't want to compromise quality to address what it lasts only 5% of the duration of the works so I prefer to take my time for the track as well you know and uh, this was only working on a very very I mean flat area uh, horizontal straight alignment um, we challenged that you know so this is uh, in Rome, and it's another type of a uh, bit more medieval uh, slip forming system, but it's a straight section in the city center street there. And again, you can see that they are using a bottom profile for the rail and filler blocks for the two sides that are there and there. Uh, <clears throat> this is Florence, a sleeper system. This, they use the French approach. 
but fun enough is the French approach with the Phoenix encapsulation around. So mix and matching things. But again, this is not far away from our system with the sleepers, the Phoenix encapsulation. And the only problem is that they use the full height asphalt from there to there without any shoulder, concrete shoulder around the rail. They are having problems at the moment. So if you don't want to use shoulders, my recommendation, go as high as possible with the concrete and leave only a minimum gap to the asphalt, which is what we try. That's Karlsruhe. This is a different system where the rails get fit into two slots that are precast and then they use uh, those pourable resins to fix the rail in place. And even in this case, you need to rely on the resins. And God knows how long they are lasting. And you know, when you deal with the manufacturers, every manufacturer has the perfect product. There is no doubt. And they can bring you as many references as you want. It's working everywhere. It's probably working for the last five years. But we want a life of 60 years. So nobody can guarantee that. Well, concrete probably is the only material at the moment. So I'm just saying, what are the risks out there? You know, they, they say, but this is very easy when you want to replace the rail because you're only cutting through rubber. Take out the rail and pour new rubber in it. And it's fine. So it's probably, the best way would be to build the light rail with different systems according to the different alignment. On a tight bands, when you know that, where you know that you need to replace rails more often, you may probably use this system while on this long stretch, but then you have to deal with the contractor telling you need to do every bit in a different system. So that would be difficult. I'll run again with the rubber fillers uh, below. So I'll cut the story short. This is recently visited. I, it's, it's interesting. It's Utrecht. And they're using the CDN, uh, sorry, the, the Edilon Cedra new uh, evolution of their system. Uh, just by curiosity, what they do there, this is the finished product. And what they do to install it, they use those very light foam filler that have no mechanical function at all. They are only made there to create a slot in the concrete. So then they, the, the, the rubber on the bottom is always a different quality. Then they put concrete up to there and then they cut out those slices and the top of the blocks. They are taken out. And they pour, this is a pourable material, which is the core clust, the one we've seen on the So really the blocks are, are only there to reduce the amount of core clust. They are voids, really. Because they think that all the boxes <laughs> are either passing through the bottom or to those two sides, the larger fences. They are not passing through the web. So the filler blocks are there because the core clust material is very expensive. Again, it's something that they only have in place. Uh, actually, this line is being built at the moment. It's the oil of line in Utrecht. But they have some sections of this already in place on tight beds. But it's only by two years now. So is that enough? Would you, as a you know infrastructure manager, take the responsibility of guinea pig uh, a system like this? That, that's a big challenge we have, really. If you want to be on the safe side, but at the same time being trying to testing new things, uh, that's, uh, it's difficult to find the balance. Precast, these are all the, there are several precast systems uh, in Paris, they use them especially to go across uh, junctions in a quick way. Uh, again, the alignment is fundamental, it needs to be as straight as possible with little vertical curves. Those could be the four big groups which we can group the, the various types of embedded track. Is there gauge control? Is it active gauge control or no active gauge, con gauge control? What kind of rate fixations? Do we have a thin encapsulation? Do we use the resins that are poured on site? Do we use filler blocks? Uh, the concrete slab, <coughs> how high is the concrete slab? Is it only supporting the rail? Is it going up to the middle of the web? Is it going up to the top? And then what kind of joint finish system? And then you can start playing with those cards and mixing them up. And not all of them can work with all the others. Um, gauge control sleepers, the different sleeper system. Direct fixation, it's an indirect kind of fussing, but there is no sleeper, and this is direct fixing into the slab. Then we have all sorts of encapsulation, ALH, the Phoenix that we have used on Lua's uh, in the last three extensions, filler blocks. When you go into filler blocks, that's what you find, as many as you like, and there is the full invention there. Some of them are flying those. So I mean, it's, this, is, this is dealing with the bottom, and there are those two that there is these boys to increase the stuff, and it, it's very difficult to do with that, I think. 
you, you can't control. The more pieces are there, the more it's difficult then to understand if there is a problem, what's going on. The old purpose of filler blocks is to make it easy to take the rail out. But then we thought, and this is something you, you don't see that, we thought on the straight alignments we're changing rails, we hope to change rails every probably 40 years. That's what we think based on the, on the current rail of wear. So 40 years, should I put in danger the stability of the rails for something that will happen once every 40 years? Or isn't that the case that after 40 years I can dismantle the full slab and rebuild it? You know, because the concrete will have probably reached its, its end of life as well. Not the concrete itself, but I mean being part of the road. On the tight curves, we think that with the strongest, hardest rail that we are using on the, on the Ruas Corsini, we have increased this, the, the rail hardness and it's more weldable because there is less carbon. So what we can do after about seven years, we think eight years, we can gauge corner weld and redeposit. So reconstitutes the rails by welding and that can be done one or twice. So that brings you to 20, 22, 23 years on the tight beds. And again, why should I then put in danger the stability of the rail on t just on tight bands where you need a very stable rail for then thinking about something that will happen every 25 years? Again, that's the balance, you know. And we took the decision of not taking the risk of having too flexible materials around the rail and go into the maintenance. It's not pushing away the problem. It can seem that, you know, I'll be retired by the time. But that's not the case. I mean, you're really balancing off the two, the two aspects. Back in Dublin now, I'll make it a bit shorter, I think, yeah, time is running fast. I'll probably finish in another 10-15 minutes, if that's fine, hopefully less. Um, so in Dublin we, we say stray current and vibration control. We want a continuous enca encapsulation, we don't want filler blocks. Share running, there is a lot of share running with roads, we can't have filler blocks for the joint stability. The previous lines, we had to learn the lessons on the shoulders that were cracking and the joints, that there was no joint for the wheel to run over. The construction support for the alignment and gauge control during construction, so we, think, we thought that the sleepers were a good, a good approach. Also because if well protected, they can be reused for the rail replacement in the future. And then <coughs> designing the track as a road, as a reinforced track slab, so using the DMRB. Constructability in narrow sites in the city centre, that was another challenge. Facing those challenges, we decided then to, this is a bit of theory, the slab is designed as a, a continuously reinforced concrete pavement as opposed to a continuously reinforced concrete base. That's because the level of protection on top, uh, you need a minimum 100 millimetre of asphalt for it to work as a concrete base because it's the level of protection to the concrete. But because we have granite sets as well and granite sets are not giving the same level of protection, the grout can crack. So we had to design it as a concrete pavement. And to increase the rail stability and the road stability at the rail edge, it's proposed that concrete in fill layer over the structure slab is brought up to the minimum distance from the... So bring the concrete as high as possible, closer to the rail. That was the initial idea. Based on that, Lua, Lua A1, road junctions were designed, as you can see there. This is a collaboration with Mount McDonald at that time. And it, it's really the German, pro the German approach. Concrete up to 40 mil below the rail, sliver, phoenix and construction, <coughs> joints on both sides. These are, <coughs> these are still there since 2009. We have now almost eight years. One could argue those junctions are not as trafficked as the keys, but there is a lot of heavy traffic going across. No crack, no dislodgement of fine materials along the rail. This proved that it was, it was a good system and without concrete shoulders along the rails. And if there is a problem in asphalt, it's much easier to replace asphalt than concrete. This is the way it was built. We tried, to, uh, we tried that system on a, <coughs> sorry, very short, this is a real scale track test that we carried out in 2013 in Red Cow, just across the junction <coughs> on the back of the Lua stop. And in five meters single track, we tested four different finishes and four different cross sections. Most of them would have been without shoulders with the asphalt and with and without shoulders with the granite sets. So those are the cross, sorry, it's a bit poor the drawing, but that was the idea. Some of them are failing, Disa it's a disaster, some of them are really a disaster, we need to go there. But that was the purpose of the test as well. You see the joint there, one was with 40 mil uh, stone mastic asphalt, and the other one was with 100 mil, this is the one, uh, of uh, hot rolled asphalt, I think. If I don't remember wrong. 
and two different joint materials, Edilon and the Schomburg. Those are rubber, rubber joints as opposed to uh, asphalt joint, bituminous joint. We use the outcomes of that test to inform the decision on the design of the track across the Rossi Hackett Bridge, which was designed in house in, T in RPA at that time, uh, and then built as we designed. So that was a, a client design, really. Um, and I'm being frank with you, it it's not a nice story, unfortunately, because what we tried to do, this is the cross section on the bridge, and it's still okay. Sh concrete shoulders, very thin sleeper, and granite sets. It's a very compact, it's very thin, because it has to sit on the very shallow deck of this bridge, which is particular just for the, for the alignment. You know, the, the Lua's alignment on top and the navigability of the river from under pushed the, the deck to be very, very shallow, and the pocket for the track was even shallower. But then, across the two keys, we use the system that you see on the bottom there, with proper sleepers and as you can see, we did not succeed in, con in convincing Dublin City Council to go with the system that we knew it was working on the USA one with a 40 millimeter of asphalt. And I'm not, again, I'm not criticizing, it's just dealing with stakeholders. Every stakeholder would have a different opinion. DCC's opinion at that time was no, 40 mil asphalt will not work on a concrete road. We have it tested in several roads in Dublin and it's peeling off. Our approach was that USA one is there to stand and prove it. But they say that's a different thing. I mean, then you start entering into the discussion what kind of asphalt have you use there, what kind of traffic do you have there, and things like that. And personal feelings, we don't have. So we had to come to a compromise which was 88 in the middle and 100 mil on the outside. But that's me why 80 because actually, no, then the 80 was due to the fact that you didn't have to go and compact under the rail leg. This is now showing 100, I think, but the reality was 80, so that we didn't have that kink under the rain. At least that, that could have made our life a bit easier. But anyway, the compaction of this asphalt didn't go well. The asphalt that, that was selected wasn't the one we wanted. And I'm not washing my hands, I'm just saying that I think there are reasons why that went wrong. Because it was too much, 100 mil of asphalt is far too much. And then blowing off with the torches as well to clean the joints blew off a lot of uh, bitumen. Now, and we could see already the days after that was done, you could see already the chips coming out of there. So that was a recipe for, <coughs> for the, bad, the bad situation that we had. And this is what we have today. Now, the picture doesn't really show you the reality. We are having problems at the joint. The asphalt is, is, is coming away. And the joint, fair play to the joint, the joint is still sticking on the rail when it's, it's void on one side, but the joint is so powerful. So we promoted the joint, we said that's the joint we want on the other lines, which was the one tested on, on Red Cow. But sure, we weren't happy with this solution. And I'm frank with you, I mean, this, this was my idea. It's, it's not working, as I would have hoped. That's why when, when we went into Lewis Cross City, we said to the contractor, now guys, this is your toy now, you have to play with it and give us something that resists. And the contractor said to us, I don't feel comfortable in going without the shoulders the concrete shoulders under it, because they would have had the liability <coughs> of, of uh, a truck in that case. So we then accepted it, and we actually agreed on the shoulder position, but then we say, then give us proper shoulders. They need to be more reinforced, more structurally sound than the one we have on the original Luas, because we don't, you know, whatever happens across the junctions, Luas Cross City will have a share running all across the city. So we can't running after patches in the city. And that's what, um, we put uh, together, a CISC Stegonfer put together with, uh, with our uh, <coughs> collaboration, let's say. And it was a long process, almost a birth. It took us almost nine months to get there. But actually, it, it, it's, it's the good aspect of design and build, I'd say. You know, uh, in a good collaborative environment, that's what came out. And I can tell you, the level of innovation that I think is in this track, uh, it's it's fundamental. There are at least <coughs> four or five aspects which are very innovative for the West Coast City. The first one is, and I'm not giving them in order of importance, it's just whatever comes to my mind. First one is that the Phoenix encapsulation has been used, but uh, with a lower profile. It doesn't come to the top, because we had problems with the Phoenix coming to the top, water ingress, the sealant uh, was giving, giving way. And then we used two rubber joints on both sides. The function of these joints, they have three functions. One is to cover the wheel thread, so the wheel won't run on concrete because this is 40 millimeters wide, 
So it's the maximum amount of displacement of the wind thread in the future. It's also seeing, so no water ingress because it's very, it's like a blue. The third point is that the rail will deflect when the tram is passing, while the concrete will not deflect. And these can accommodate these kind of movements without breaking the joint. So it does three things actually. And uh, the Phoenix stopped there with the 45 degree cuts. The second introduction innovation is the sleeper, which actually we have seen in the other lines. It's the thin steel sleeper that supports the construction and ensures the gauge is controlled during construction. We'll see the pictures soon. The third innovation, I think, is the shoulders are much wider, up to 190 millimeters. Um, instead of 150, so they are about 25% about wider than the original, and they are more reinforced. You can see the level of reinforcement is made of those kind of U-shaped hooks, stirrups, and two longitudinal bars, one on each uh, shoulder. Now there has been a long discussion about the reinforcement. I personally had some issues with some of these aspects, but overall I'd say it's, it's a good design. And, uh, the problem with this, I'd say, if I, if, I, if I can say, is that those shapes are embedded into the first slab. So I remember initially the discussion was, how do we ensure, in the lack of the rail, that the level, the top level of those two hooks is exactly 50 millimeters below the top of rail? Because that was, that needs to be. The cover has to be 50 millimeters minimum, and it can't be over 50, so it's precisely 50. Because if it's more than 50, the two longitudinal bars are dropping and you have the shoulder under enforced. So there is no play there. It's 50 plus or minus 5 probably. And if you don't have the rain in place, how can you know whether or not this is exactly the level? You can't go there and measure the level of each one every 200 millimeters. So the rain then got in and then the idea was we put the first layer only after the rains are set there. Then the rains are brought in and you'll see that the, 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 the reinforcement, the, all the cages and the rails and the stirrups for the shoulders have to be in before we pull the first board. And then a system quality control check became almost obsessive in the sense that we have to measure each one of them levels from the top of the rail to ensure that they are exactly 50 mil below. And we didn't achieve it everywhere. So that, that, that was an issue of quality control. The, another innovation of this track is that it's very tight, only 2.2 meters. So that's the tightest the slab and better track we had in Dublin. And that's all due to the fact that we had to build it in narrow construction sites. And how to deal the differential, um, the risk of differential cracks on the asphalt, because this is some, some, often this is asphalt coming in, as you can see there. So the idea was to chamfer the edge at 45 degrees. Otherwise, according to the design manual for all the bridges, we should have provided a geotextile, a stress relieving membrane which has to be overlapped 500 millimeters on each side, they would have required 500 mil of concrete additional, which the contractor didn't want to do, but for very good value reasons. So the idea is we chamfer it, and then we transform vertical loads into horizontal, and it would address the cracking issue. So far, it's proving successful. Uh, those are some of the, of the innovation of, of this track system. Uh, on top of that, a uh, harder rail for the tight curves. You can see the shoulder construction here with the exposed aggregate and the joint on both sides. All the relative levels are quite important. So quality on site becomes paramount for the success of this, of this track type. I have to say that we were so pleased uh, to see that the construction across O'Connell Street took only four weeks, actually six weeks of shutdown of the red line as opposed to three months initially planned. So that's a sign of how good this track system was in accelerating the installation. And this is also a panel square. Y you can see the very wide shoulder there. This is exactly what I was telling you about, the different phases. The <coughs> sub-base in CHC10, that's, uh, that's light concrete for the, for the foundation level. On top of that, the cages are installed with the stirrups already. Then the rails and the sleepers, you can see the flat steel sleepers are brought in shutters around that's the that's the control of the levels of the stirrups there and the longitudinal bar and then the concrete gets poured that's the first level of concrete then second shutters round for the shoulder pour and then the shoulders are poured finally you can see that the timbers there to provide the two slots 
for the future installation of the joints, which is this one, rubber joints on both sides, and then the finish finishes in the four foot and in the six foot. Quite convoluted. These are some of the quality issues that I was mentioning to you about. The problem is when you bring concrete up to the surface, that's what you're facing. Is the, is the, I'm not sure what I meant by this one, but for example, this shows you that the longitudinal bar was quite low because in some sections the stirrups were left too low. <coughs> and the risk is you end up with a, with a, a concrete uh, upstand which is very lightly reinforced. So there have been cracks that are probably shrinkage, but the shrinkage needs to be. So there is still discussions ongoing on some areas, but uh, overall I have to say I'm, I'm quite happy with the quality really. And some chips on the sides. Other problems with the levels, that happens because of the, of the of the shutters that were used for pulling the, the shoulders. And in fact, that was addressed by using much heavier system to avoid floating the, 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 the two, the two uh, timbers on, on both sides, which were dictating the levels. Problem is, when we, get, when we got the levels too high, and in this case it's about 20 mil higher than it should be, immediately you get, you get this uh, chipping edge, because it's, it's due to road traffic. Uh, doesn't look great. It's not everywhere. Uh, thank God, it's only in some some areas. Uh, but that that's a very good finish instead. You can see the levels are all flush with the rail, and it was achieved in several sections. So you see, the joint has to be three millimeter below the rail and below the shoulder. The shoulder has to be flush with the with the rail. Exposed aggregates on for for skid resistance. It it looks extremely extremely accurate. These are some pictures taken in, in Stevens Green and with the finishes. These are the granite sets I was speaking about. This is just this morning, I just started it now. This Cabra Stop, uh, the, this will actually be a very nice stop when it's all cluttered. And uh, that's the construction through College Green. So is any question? several uh, meetings with international partners that are coming over to Dublin to have a look and I'm actually I'm presenting this now I'm, I'm, I'm from Italy uh, myself uh, as you can imagine presenting it uh, Monday now in Rome there is a huge uh, international transport pro uh, um, uh, congress and I'm going with Lewis City truck so it's enough an hour We'll see. It's it's quite. I mean, it's not the first time I present it, you know. So it it's spreading the the voice, and I think when people come over, they see it, and generally the reaction I get is, "Ah, oh, yeah, but how much? You're spending a fortune." And I say, "Yes, it's costing. It's not a cheap system, to us, I'd say compared to others. But then over the lifetime of 60 years, you know, it's not the track that is the the, the big cost." When people think that the Luas is very expensive, it's actually what we're doing to the city that is expensive. It shouldn't be seen as a cost of the Luas. We are doing streets from building to building. That's what we're doing. If it's only the track, track costs about 3,000 euros per linear meter. So if instead of 3,000, it's 3,200, it doesn't kill the project. It's not the track to do it right. You know? mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think we, we are well placed as a, as a benchmark in, in Europe. Yeah. yeah. For an embedded track, once the temporary sleep is in, there's a metal plate, yeah. does it play any part in the permanent line? Uh, no, we, we don't think so, especially not in, uh, um, in the asphalt finish sections, because, sorry, I forgot to tell you that when it's asphalt, the pocket is only 100 millimeters for the asphalt. So actually the rail is 160, so more part of the rail is embedded in the concrete of the main slab, plus the shoulders around. So they are playing a big part, especially because we use the, those levers every three meters. Well, the manufacturer suggests to use them every uh, one and a half meter. So for us, they are only playing a part during construction. 
after the concrete has set, it's the concrete that is doing the job, I think. That, that's my view. Just as an aside, I've been working on this for about three years and I learned a lot tonight, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> the grooves.